Friends, uh, I don't know if anybody's noticed, but I've been preaching on kind of the same theme for five weeks. This is week number six. Uh, we've been doing this all church, small group experience for Lent, the six weeks of Lent, and now we're entering into the sixth week of this. How many of you who are involved in the small groups, the crazy love study, have found it, shall we say, a bit challenging? Anybody find it a bit challenging? Yeah, we see a few hands there. Okay, the rest of you are on top of it, I know, yeah. I mean, confronting us are some questions like, are you a lukewarm Christian? Do you give the leftovers of your time and money to God? I mean, just the leftovers. Is God really a significant influence in your life? These are questions that are just like that horn honking. <laughs> they don't go away. They just keep beep, beep, beeping on you. Seriously. Even if you're on the path following Christ, these questions come back up. They're hard to forget. And sometimes these questions make us squirm when we seriously look at how we live. Last week I heard a great kind of approach to this from one of our small group leaders. I've been meeting with the small group leaders on Wednesday evenings before the classes. And this small group leader said, well, I kind of look at this crazy love as kind of like, you know, a performance review at work. How many of you have ever given those and received those? Yeah, you know kind of how they go. And where you're strong in, what you're doing well, and where you need improvement, right? And you can tell an employee if they're going to grow or not, how they react to the where you need improvement part. If you start hearing excuses and pointing the finger or circumstances or these are really the wrong questions to ask me, then maybe they're not so much interested in improving themselves. So I like that metaphor, kind of like a performance review for the Christian life. So if you've been made a little bit uncomfortable or maybe a whole lot uncomfortable, just remember this. There is no comfort in your growth zone. Neither is there any growth in your comfort zone. So what does it mean to be all in for Jesus? You know, you know how it is when you stick your toe in the pool of water just to kind of test it out. Is it going to be a little too cold or not? Then maybe you get in up to your ankle. But to be all in, you got to get in over your head, right? So what does it mean to be all in for Jesus? It means to be up to your eyeballs with him. I have a tough time with this talk of, of loving Jesus. That's the one, one of the areas I have a tough time with this crazy love book and study we did. He talks a lot about loving God, just passionately loving God. I, I don't know, that doesn't connect with me that much. I guess I, I put too much romantic freight on that word love. But, but as I said previously, when the Bible talks about loving God, it's not a romantic type of love. It's more like being devoted and committed to someone who saved your life. It's like having a friend so close, someone you've been through tough times with, that you'd do anything for him. So when you're all in for someone, you'll sacrifice your time and your money and your comfort and your convenience for him. Years ago, I, I came to this conclusion concerning the Christian faith. If we're going to do this Christian thing, then let's just do it. Like that Nike commercial says. What does it say? Just do it. Oh, I guess kind of like the Bible says. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And Jesus said to us, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. 
and yet we hesitate to commit to him totally. Here's the thing. Not much exciting really happens in our living, in our Christian life, until we're all in and going for it. Until that time, we read stuff in the Bible and it seems like it's in a galaxy far, far away. Those people and their experiences. But once we get in up to our eyeballs with Jesus, it starts to really make sense. Which leads me right to robots. Weren't you thinking robots too? Yeah. Robots have been a, a thing of science fiction for a long time. And these days, robots are a reality, actually. They're doing more than ever, from auto manufacturing to surgery. They're teaching kids in high school how to build robots. Did you know that? There's classes on robotics in high school. We like robots. Don't we? Because they mechanically do things for us without any back talk. Right? They don't give us any lip. Do robots have free will? Or are they controlled by their makers and their masters? Can you have a genuine give and take relationship with a robot? Well, if the robot doesn't do what you want, you unplug them or take out the battery, right? Done. Done deal. Can robots love with heart, soul, and mind? You all know the answer. They can't. We don't really have a relationship with God if we're driven by fear or obligation, as though we were simply programmed to grovel before God or mindlessly obey him like a robot. God doesn't want robots. What God really wants with us is a relationship of mutual love. And that can only happen if we're free. Don't you crave these kinds of genuine relationships? Don't you want that with your children? I do, although in the teenage years I'd settle for a robot. <laughs> Don't you want that kind of genuine relationship in your marriage? And how many who've been married a long time find themselves kind of in a robotic relationship? <laughs> What brings glory to God is when believers desire him, not as robots or slaves, but as free agents who've recognized his goodness and his greatness and want to be with him and want to be like him. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Do you live as though faith demonstrated through love of God and neighbor is the only thing that really counts in your life? Can't say that I always do. I go through a lot of days where I'm off in other directions. And yet I've found that lukewarm Christianity isn't very fulfilling or very joyful. But the solution isn't to just try harder, make bigger promises to God, and fail those two. That, you know, that would just make loving God another obligation or task on my to-do list. Who wants to pursue a boring, guilt-ridden chore? You need to love God more. Anybody here want to do that? I don't think so. <clears throat> Psalm 63 says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. And why is it so people earnestly seek God as though his love is better than life? Why is it? Human nature, I guess. Our nature 
just isn't all that comfortable with giving full devotion to God. We give our devotion to other things or other people. We say in the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done. But who really wants that? We walk out of here and something comes up and my will be done. Can human nature be changed? You know that old saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, right? But here's the truth of that saying. We are not dogs. You and I are not dogs. We're made in God's image. And even though that godly image has been tarnished by sin, Jesus can remake it and restore us to his image. That's the whole meaning of the gospel, of course. In Christ Jesus, we can be changed. And it does happen. That's why we talk about bringing people to the transforming power of Jesus Christ. Remember from last week the words of Jesus to the church at Laodicea? He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door. Underline that in your outline there if you're using it. I stand at the door. Underline that. That's where he is. He's standing at the door to your life. There he is. He doesn't exhort us saying, here I am, now just try harder. God just wants to give us himself. And when we let him in, not just lip service, but when we actually let him into our life, good things begin to happen. One of Charles Wesley's greatest hymns, we sang it uh, last Sunday night, actually, at the worship night, says this. It sings, Finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee. Change from glory into glory, till in heaven we seek our place. He's singing about what Christ can do in us when we open the door and let him in. Restore that new creation in us, till in heaven we take our place. Till in heaven we take our place. Well, that's fine and dandy. But what about the sin that still stalks you and me? What about my past? What about my messed up family? What about my grandma's cancer? What about the car accident that took my friend? What about the divorce? What about all the poor people? What about... What about you fill in the blank? Psalm 28 says, My heart leaps for joy, and I will give thanks to him in song. Yet it sure is hard to find joy in the Lord when there's so much trouble all around us. We're more likely to recite Psalm 39 that says, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Be not deaf to my weeping. Well, the fact is, God is not deaf to our weeping and the cries of our struggle, including our struggle to be all in for him. Jesus told us, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. When we're all in for him, guess what? We're on the winning team. That's right. He's overcome the world. So don't ever despair of being his genuine disciple. Don't ever despair of being anything more than a lukewarm Christian. We don't have to fall into that old trap of saying, well, you know, well, nobody's perfect, and use that as an excuse to quit pursuing perfection in Christ. He also told us 
The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. What does he mean by the one who is in you? He means when you open the door, he can come in. Have you opened the door to him yet? What does he mean by the one who's in the world? He means, yeah, the evil one who so easily tempts us and distracts us down the other road. The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. We have a hope that keeps us praying and fighting the good fight and not growing weary and being for him and with him and in him. When you are serious about your Christian faith, get this now, when you're serious about your Christian faith, you will honestly confess your follies and your fallen nature. And if you're really serious, you'd have to weep and repent. And that's just where you will discover the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And then at his invitation... You can find your place at his banqueting table. And then, then you can laugh out loud. When you really realize who you are, he says, hey, but you want, you want me to come sit up there? You laugh out loud at that because his grace is so good and so freeing and so very true. There's an old Yiddish proverb that says, laughter can be heard farther than weeping. The gospel is tragedy because it makes us face those tough questions, who we really are. And then when we find the grace of God, the gospel is comedy. It's almost too good to be true. You know, you can pretend that you're fully devoted to God, but he knows the truth. You can't fool God. Don't ever try. Instead, get real with God. Tell him, tell him. Get real with him. Tell him how you think you've been cheated in life. Tell him how you've been wrongly treated or that you're angry with him for the way things have turned out. Go ahead. Or for letting other people mess up your life. Go ahead, do that. Get real with him. And while you're at it, tell God you haven't made him the center of your life. You haven't turned to him for guidance and help when others were messing up your life or you were being cheated in life. Most of the times you've just complained to him when things were falling apart. Get real with God. Tell him you've been lukewarm because you've chosen something or someone else so often. Now, if you've come this far in our all-church small group study, or, or you've come this far in seeking God in church, I believe that you can tell God that you do want to experience satisfaction and joy in your relationship with him, but you find it oh so difficult. God, I, I want to treasure your kingdom, but man, I, I need help. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. That should be our prayer. I mentioned the evil one earlier the one who's in this world. You know, Satan fell from heaven due to gravity. He had too much gravitas. He took himself way too seriously. And all the time, we're trying to be something. We're trying to prove our greatness and our goodness. All that time that we're trying to do all those great things, life can be heavy and probably joyless. You know, it's, it's when you can laugh at yourself at your own efforts to be great or holy or pure, it's when you can laugh at yourself that you'll be on your way toward those very things with God's help. In the Bible, the words fear not 
are found 365 times. Fear not, 365 times. You know what? That's once for every day of the year. Fear not, God will help you. Now, let me close this by saying, God created the heavens and the earth in six days. That's what the scriptures tell us. And on the seventh day, God, what? Rested. And on the eighth day, God started receiving complaints. <laughs> Here's a word for us. Here's a word for us. Stop complaining about the management of the universe. Look around for a few places to sow seeds of happiness and goodness. And what kind of seeds are you sowing? And what seeds will you sow today? We insist in our small group experiences that they include some kind of hands-on service to others with genuine needs. Get out there and, you know, do something. Be the hands and feet of Christ. As followers of Jesus, our expression of love for him must come in concrete actions, not just words. I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I do know, the only ones among you who will really find the joy of the Lord are those who will have understood how to serve. It's worth repeating right here, friends. It's worth repeating. There is no comfort in your growth zone, neither is there any growth in your comfort zone. That's why we insist, you know, small groups, get out there, maybe a little out of your comfort zone. That's where the growth occurs. So, as we, we wind up this six weeks of crazy love, here's the question for each of us again. Are you a lukewarm Christian? Look again at your time, your money. Then you can look back at your attitude and your words, and your actions. If you give God the foremost, you will never have to worry about the devil taking the hindmost. So, let's put our faith into action and discover the joy found in the Lord. For joy is the echo of God's life in us. Would you join me in reciting this passage of scripture from Psalm 90? Psalm 90, verse 14. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Psalm 90, 14. Amen.